Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. There has been some progress this week on South Africa's Just Energy Transition Partnership Investment Plan. Terence Creamer joins me to discuss developments. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. What is the background to the so-called JETP investment plan? You know, in the run-up to COP26, which took place in Glasgow, Scotland last year, after being delayed because of COVID, there was quite a lot of work that took place, really led by Eskom, but also some of the government departments around whether we couldn't make an offer to the international community <coughs> to decarbonize our electricity system, our energy system. And uh, that was put together in a just energy transition plan. And at COP26, uh, developed country partners sort of signed up to this plan and also made an offer of 8.5 billion dollars, which is about 150 billion rand, to support this just transition. So it'd have the element of decarbonization and then the just element would be to support um, communities and workers that are vulnerable to this transition, especially in the coal value chain and in Pumalanga. And uh, that, so that was announced uh, on the sidelines of COP26 uh, by South Africa, by France, by Germany, by the UK, by the US, and the European Union. Th those are the partners. And then since then, there's been a, a process, primarily by the South African government, which set up a climate finance task team under Daniel Manelli. And they've been working on this investment plan for some time. And it, it has been broadened beyond electricity to include electric vehicles as well as the uh, green hydrogen sector try to try and get that those two nascent industries going in South Africa. So that's really the background. It's a, it's a work that South Africa did and then took to the international community and then an offer of financing, concessional financing was made uh, and then the investment plan is what's been worked on since then and that w is what, w as we approach COP27, which will take place in Sharm el-Sheikh uh, in Egypt in November or next month. Uh, this is when this plan should be fully unveiled uh, and endorsed by the partners. So that's really the background. A decarbonization offer, somewhat accelerated, but in return we get concessional finance and support for workers and communities that are vulnerable. Cabinet has now endorsed the plan. What happens now? Yes, I think that's an important milestone. You know that some in the cabinet have been sceptical, including the energy minister, about this just energy transition partnership. Um, and there's been a lot of debate around it. But it was presented, both the partnership and the investment plan, to cabinet this week and endorsed by cabinet. And there will now be also a, uh, some public consultation in South Africa once it's unveiled at COP. 27. Um, so I think that's what we're going to see now. We're going to get a, a bit more of a briefing about what's contained therein, um, as well as the process of getting more voices and society buy-in. Although a lot has been done, I suppose the framework is such that you know the, the money is going to be channeled in certain directions. Uh, so I don't know how much can be changed, but definitely civil society and workers want a greater voice in how this is rolled out. We must remember that the $8.5 billion is far, is very important, but it falls far short of what we need over the next 10 and more years and more. Uh, it's probably a tenth of what South Africa needs just for the next 10 years in terms of the transition. We know a lot of coal plants will be decommissioned. We know that it has to be replaced by a large quantity of wind and solar because those are now the cheap cheapest forms of new electricity and will have to become the workhorses of the new system and that will have to be backed up by a grid that is fit for purpose and that opens up the acreage where we have the best resources so there's an expectation that some of the money will flow towards grid and it, it has to be backed up by those flexible generation options that keep uh, the lights on when the wind's not blowing when the sun's not shining so that can be in the form of uh, gas or that can be in the form of battery storage or pumped hydro. There's a number of technologies. Um, but what is clear, I think, from the 8.5 billion concessional finance is it's not going to be funding any new gas. There's still some debate about the best uses of these concessional funds. 
Yes, this debate's been chugging along since the, the partnership was announced because of the addition of electric vehicles and green hydrogen into the mix. I mean, it was very much an electricity-focused plan, and we know that's really very the priority, both for decarbonisation as well as for security of supply. So really, that has to be the, the bulk, the lion's share. But there is an ongoing discussion around the value of the electric vehicle element, for instance, and the green hydrogen element. If you don't have electrons in the system, for instance, you can't do the green hydrogen at scale. You need to have that surplus electricity in the system, and it has to be green. <laughs> it has to be renewable. You can't be making hydrogen into the future uh, with coal, gas. Uh, you can in the temporary phase, you know, with, with uh, carbon capture and storage, produce blue hydrogen, as they say, but that's not going to be acceptable for the long term. So that's not the sort of asset we should be trying to build. We know that we are a massive hydrogen economy as it is because Sassel produces so much hydrogen for its, uh, ahead of its production of, of chemicals and fuels in the fisher chops process, but that's very dirty hydrogen, very carbon intensive. So there's still debate whether concessional finance should go to something that's not quite ready uh, or and, w and where there's a lot of private sector money, for instance, green hydrogen. And there's also debate whether concessional money, which could be in the form mostly of loans, but some grants should be going to electric vehicle OEMs who will just simply pass that on through to their shareholders in Europe and America. So I think what where it will settle is the bulk of the plan will have to be around electricity. And I think a big portion within the electricity will have to be about the grid. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our engineering news daily email newsletter.